Greetings, friends. This is Chris Batts, and you are listening to episode number 12 of the Future is Bright podcast. In today's episode, I spoke with Sharon Mann and Gary Miles. Both are accomplished and seasoned legal recruiters working with partners, groups, and firm mergers. We discussed several relevant topics for both partners and law firms, such as the market conditions with raising interest rates, firm layoffs, and a recession. We discussed advice for law partners and law firms, law partner and associate compensation trends, the competitive landscape for law firms, and so much more. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes and YouTube. Well, Aaron and Gary to the Future is Bright podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate being here. So um, I'd love for you two to provide a brief bio about yourselves. If you both would share um, some history, what you're doing, where you're at, that would be great to set some context. I'm sure many people know you. Go ahead, Sharon. I'll let you lead. <laughs> so I uh, jokingly refer to myself as a recovering attorney. I started my career by practicing in uh, large international law firms, uh, of which I enjoyed very much, but I segued over to the legal recruiting and consulting side approximately two decades ago. And um, I have been enjoying work based in New York City, but I work internationally as well. Uh, in the course of my career, I've placed over approximately 800 partners. Done, I've done mergers and uh, based in New York, and I'm looking forward to a good year in 2023. Thank you, Sharon. Gary? Well, so I, my story is a little bit different. Um, I got into the legal recruiting industry 15, 16 years ago after spending a slightly more than a decade teaching at-risk youth in uh, Watts and coaching high school basketball in Compton. I joined uh, Alan Miles, my uncle, variable uncle, who was one of the original early recruiters on the West Coast. I'm based out here in California. Um, worked there uh, with Alan Miles and Associates for a number of years before it was time you know, for, for Alan to kind of wind down and, and, and retire and, and went out and opened my own shop Miles Partner Placement in 2015. Um, like Sharon, I've placed, although I, I don't have an exact count, but like Sharon, I've played hundreds of partners, uh, significant groups uh, known in the industry for maybe most in, in the merger, with respect to the merger aspect of the industry, um, introduced and facilitated the acquisition of then McKee Nelson by Bingham McCutcheon. Um, and have brokered some smaller situations since then, but pretty much partner, you know, only recruiting, uh, group movement, multi-faceted, sometimes multi-location, and uh, really enjoy being here and seeing my dear friend Sharon, who we've known each other, <laughs> gosh, probably going on about, I would say about 12 years now or something like that, 10 or 12 years. It's It's been a long time. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, it has so, been a long time. So I'm really happy to have you guys both on the show. And um, you will be my inaugural first episode of a panel. And so we'd love to start off with some key topics that are hitting the news and are relevant for corporate law firms and partners today. Um, obviously, there's this, we're coming off of um, very rich, low interest rates and lots of hyper growth that our clients have seen and participated with their clients. Um, there's news of some layoffs. There's news of a pending recession coming. Um, what are you two seeing um, uh, in the in, in the marketplace right now for candidates and clients? Sharon, if you want to, do I take that? Uh, I, well, I, I'm right across the street from Goldman Sachs, so I'm reading it right here in Manhattan. So I'm reading mm -hmm. the news every day, and I'm I'm looking for those black cars to see if the Goldman Sachs bankers are doing the deals late night. That usually determines how well the economy is doing, depending on how late those black cars are picking up the bankers late at night. Um, I'm seeing less. I think that with the layoffs at Goldman Sachs, usually the lawyers follow suit with their clients and. There's so much talk about an impending recession. I think we're seeing a slowdown in the corporate world. Uh, the law firms usually take their cues from their clients. If there's layoffs at the big banks and financial institutions, there's going to be a slowdown in the corporate work as well. So when the corporate work goes 
down. The pendulum swings up for bankruptcy, restructuring, and litigation. So we're seeing more of that. Uh, and as Gary knows, he's an expert in the field as well. We know that it's always cyclical. It goes up and down, and this happens to be a down period. Yeah. What do you think, Gary? Say, yeah, I would agree with Sharon's assessment in that things will not be as hyperactive as they were for 2020, 2021, once firms kind of adjusted to how they're going to, you know, the, the new world after the pandemic, you know, first hit. Uh, that being said, at the level that, that I think, you know, Sharon, I know Sharon and I typically operate in, um, there's still a lot of activity because law firms, even in recession, will still seek out, you know, particularly opportunistic, strategic partner and group hires, uh, particularly ones that move, you know, meaningful books of business that, that where client synergies exist. Um, so the, at this echelon of, of the industry, I think we will be buffeted somewhat from the the larger scale impacts of a recession you know uh, usually when the recessions hit you see much more severe impact on associate recruiting you might see you know this better than i do chris obviously i don't do in-house but you'll see corporations and companies pull back um and law firms typically what happens in these situations where the economy is impacted they will still hire, but the level of diligence that law firms will do with each, um, you know, potential hire will, will, will pick up even more. You're not going to see the same type of, you know, folks moving in a process that took a week, uh, or two weeks mm-hmm. or three weeks. Processes will take longer. Um, and there'll be more diligence done, I think. So, so Gary and Sharon, I'd love for you to share advice to partners, groups, and then law firm leadership. So two different dynamics, knowing a lot of your guys' practice, if not all of it, is marketing partners and groups and candidates to law firms. What advice would you give partners right now facing this pending recession? And then uh, what advice would you give corporate firms as they're positioning strategically and thinking? I'd say, I'd say hire wisely. We know that we're going into a downturn and what you don't want to do is um, there's always talks of layoffs and you don't want to lay off some of your practices. You have to be very um, decisive about how you want to balance that. You don't want to lay off too many people in your firm and then have to rehire them when the market is on the upswing again. We've seen that time and time again with the law firms and um, you know it costs a lot to pay with recruiting fees. It takes a lot of time to re-recruit, I guess, for lack of a better word. So I think I would give advice to say, look, take a true stock and a true assessment of what your law firm offers and try to do your best to try to balance out keeping existing practice areas as much as you can without trying to to leave them at risk for not having any business should the market uh, go south. Um, But I do think that, you know, what Gary had talked about before the law firms are not paying the big bonuses to the recruiters as much. When the market slows down a bit, there's not as much of a need. So they're going to hold back a little bit on that front. So I think law firms just to be just need to be a little wiser about what where they're going and what direction they're going as uh, there's an impending recession and plan accordingly. I do want to mention quickly that well, at the start of the pandemic, I think everyone thought that there was going to be an impending recession and then the SPACs kicked in. So that was interesting because all of a sudden there was a big pickup in corporate work, which a lot of people didn't anticipate initially. So you have to be careful about what you're doing, how you're hiring, and be very careful about the upcoming trends and hire accordingly. And piggybacking on that, um, Chris, what Sharon said, the I think what, what with respect to from the candidate side or from the group side, right, you have to be very, uh, one, judicious about your search. Make sure you're working with an elite professional that really knows, you know, and has a better sense of how your practice might fit, might benefit on any given firm's platform so that you can really streamline your search and and look at the right types of opportunities. The, 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 the the recruiters at, at our level, and there's, there's a number of folks at the elite level where they really have law firm leadership contacts and understand which firms are actually outperforming the market now versus how firms are all going to market to the outside community 
um, and try to, you know, use the makeup and cover the blemishes that that tend to, um, you know, come out when when economic environment is not as, um, you know, fruitful. Or it's more we're looking at a potential recession. Um, the biggest thing that I can say to both law firm leaders or recruiting structures within law firms and candidates is really be uh, transparent yeah. in the process and, and understand, you know, how market conditions might impact your practice so that you're giving the most appropriate, you know, uh, picture of, of what your practice looks like, what the, the different scenarios can be, law firms, you know, being transparent with recruiters and candidates about, you know, how the market environment is going to impact decision making around hiring, decision making around setting compensation, et cetera. Um, and, and that's not something that just we need in the, or we should have in the, you know, environment we're in now, even in good, in good environments. Um, transparency really can help, you know, make a process much more productive on all fronts. Great points on all sides, guys. Thank you. Um, let's talk about, so you guys had the substantial years and decades of experience in doing these complex high-level transactions. I would love for you to share um, key areas that either have been mistakes made or um, wisdom and advice you would give. So Gary, you brought up transparency. Sharon, you're talking about, you know, being mindful of the market conditions and not reacting too quickly um, and really know what your firm offers. So when you're in the thick of those transactions, what is it that you wish you could have told those candidates or the ones that have slipped up that are, I wouldn't call, you could say common mistakes or some of them that torpe torpedo deals or things like that. What, what advice would you give candidates through this? I think that candidates really have to know their clients. And when they're going to a law firm, when you're filling out lateral partner questionnaire forms, and those are the due diligence forms that the law firms give to the to the candidates, um, I think it's really important, as Gary said, to be transparent. And I think that it's extremely important to figure out what realistically you can set your goals to be when you're going to a new law firm. It's almost impossible to know what your compensation might be or what your business may bring, especially when the markets are volatile or we're heading into a recession or an, ups or an upswing, you're not sure. But I think a lot of times some of the mistakes in the past have been that law firms have paid probably too much money for lateral hires. They've overpaid. And that has been an issue. That has been a problem. Some of the law, bigger law firms can buffer that. And if they make a mistake in hiring, then, you know, if, if they overpaid, that's okay. They can kind of, you know, uh, cushion the blow. But with smaller law firms in particular, if you make that type of mistake, that could take a huge chunk of your budget. It also makes the candidate a target. Your partners may resent you for making too much money. You really have to have a fit on both sides. It has to be the right fit compensation-wise for both the law firm as well as with the candidate. Um, Gosh, our stories for days on big deal <laughs> the, the old coach the old basketball coach in me i was saying you always remember vividly the losses much more than you remember the wins yeah. you know and and <laughs> it, i think there's it, it really here's here's the one thing i've always approached this part of with this segment of the, of, of the industry one no group placement is the same. They all have their own individual dynamics internally with the group, uh, as it relates to interaction with the law firm. And if I could go back and tell myself, you know, my younger self on significant transactions that, you know, that fell through for one reason or another, um, it would, it would always be get Try to get involved with as many of the components, you know, at the partner level. Obviously, you can't talk to the support staff, but that 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 make up a significant group, multi-partner, multifaceted, maybe multi-practice group, multi-location. Have conversations directly with as many of the folks in the mix 
as you possibly can. Um, while it's a lot easier, and it used to be when I first came into the industry, it was always kind of assumed but with big groups, you're typically looking at one or two major rainmakers and, and the rest of the team following. Uh, I would say over the last seven, eight years, I've seen a lot more, many more situations where inevitably the tail ends up wagging the dog. Oh, wow. it, you know, to use a, a metaphor. And so really trying to understand as many of the individual needs, agendas that exist in one of these complex transactions can be immensely helpful for both the recruiter and the firm that's trying to recruit a team. You know, so it's, I mean, I know without saying any names, I know that in, in it was either 2019 or 2020, I'm personally responsible because of a deal that fell apart for changing the entire comp system at a, you know, AMLA 100 law firm in order to retain what I was trying to pull out. <laughs> and, you know, you can't, you can prepare for a lot of things, but there are always going to be the things that you can't see that could upset the deal. My other saying, and Sharon knows this well, because she's heard it at conferences and we've talked about it on the phone is in any of these deals, there's probably thousands of individual specific reasons big and small that that deal will should fall apart and only a handful where if you hit on all of them it'll happen and that's that's what we deal with sharon and i on a daily basis in our practice you know so you just have to learn to see around corners as best you can and it's hard because with some of the bigger deals, you know, that there's so many people that are involved and um, it just gets very complicated. And these deals can take a quick amount of time or they could take years to do, too. So some of these deals are just ongoing. And you're always looking at market information, trying to figure out where, where this is going to pivot. Um, it's hard. When I first joined the legal recruiting field, I thought, well, you just place a person in a firm. You call up the firm and you place the person in the firm. Not so. There are so many elements of the deal that have to fit. The cultural fit. It has to be the right compensation, the right practice area, the right personality. Everything has to fit. And it's a lot. You know, you're dealing with the human factor. So there's a lot of elements that can actually tank the deal, as Gary said. So curiosity, um, what's the longest it took to close a deal? <laughs> Gary, you want to go first? <laughs> you want to go first? Okay. The longest it took to close a deal. Um, I want to say we had one close that that took from the time we first introduced the conversation. And it wasn't active throughout, right? Like conversations started and they slowed down. Then something came up. I want to say we there have been deals that I've worked on for at least two two years, twenty eight months, something in that in that range. I'm thinking of one particularly that that you know I've closed not uh, not too long ago. That took eighteen months roughly. Um, and then, but the ones like I said are the worst. The ones that you worked on for that period of time think you have a deal in place, and then they don't happen. That okay. that is an absolute yeah, it's heartbreaking. Thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a brutal. Thing. <laughs> I would say about twenty four to twenty eight months is probably the longest I've ever worked on a single transaction. Yeah, Sharon, I've done merge a merger deal where I actually went through two chairmen of the firm, two separate chairmen. It took me about four years. It started where I was meeting with a smaller firm of about one hundred and fifty lawyers. And they wanted me to recruit for them. And then I turned it around and, and the firm decided to be acquired by a Global 100 firm. So this just took, there was 150 lawyers that had to gel with the new firm. And they at one point said, we can't do the deal. There's a conflict. I'm like, oh no. And then a couple of weeks later, they said, oh, the conflict cleared. I'm like, yes, there's a lot of highs and lows in this business. This is why I have to run just to get out the frustration. You have to, you have to have some type of side, like, way to relax in this industry. It's you're on 24 seven, your clients are calling you all the time, your candidates, your clients. It just seems like you never really get a break. Uh, but for my, for my, my largest deal, I think the most, most time was probably four or five years with the, with the merger deal. That was a big one yeah. with a lot of, a lot of ebbs and flows and a lot of twists. It was a long time. I, mine was 36 uh, months. So I did three years for wow. a group, two offices, a group of seven. <laughs> so 
lots of drama, lots of ups and downs, but we all know that, <laughs> but that's why we're in the business. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, another question that always is the hottest topic for our candidates and for clients is talk to my listeners about compensation trends. What are you seeing? Has inflation really affected partner pay? Um, what are you seeing in the market about these premiums with these huge partners coming from uh, large shops and getting gobbled up? I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I'll, I why don't I, I mean, go for on your Gary. Can I jump in there? Go Gary. Go for it. Yeah, please, no, please. So that's that's it's almost counterintuitive. You assume that because we're going into a recession um, and coming out of like just a crazy time, right? Like. 2020 and you know particularly in transactional practices firms you know so you know so loose with what they were willing to spend because they had capacity issues right yeah. with with their own clients uh but i will tell you that compensation hasn't changed in in all of that regard firms the 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 reality is this if you have an elite practice with they generate significant revenue and the profit margin is really good on that practice. The compensation that firms will put forth, particularly when it's a practice that is so that is strategically aligned with an area that the, a firm needs to wants to or has decided to really invest in. Um, you know, you don't see much of a change in um, um, compensation. I mean, I can tell you that, you know, in the last year and, and moving forward, like we're we're at the table on some deals where um or have completed some deals where folks made double digit comp numbers. So I mean, you know, you're talking eight figures in compensation. Um, you know, or or high seven figures in compensation. Like it still happens. It's not it but those situations, you know, again, the amount of diligence that has to get done, the amount of level of comfort that firm leaders have to, you know, have, and it's not just the firms that you would assume. Like everyone assumes Kirkland, you know, Paul Hastings has been super active and, you know, some of these higher, very profitable firms, um, they do it, but there are other firms that would surprise you in terms of, you know, the level of comp that they will put on the table for what they term a game changer. Sure. So what I, what I noticed with um, Chris with, with and Gary with the um, with the lockstep model um, over the course of over you know close to three decades of working in this industry, I've seen where firms used to be more in line with that everyone gets paid the same and it doesn't matter uh, that the, the business belongs to the firm and not to a single individual partner. So I think what's really a game changer is that now, as Gary and I know, and what keeps us very active in this industry, is that the partners with the biggest books of business. And what I mean by that is that those with the client relationships can go anywhere. And the law firms are now more specifically focused on partners and their business, regardless of credentials, regardless of anything else. Revenue is a huge driver in what law firms will pay for partners. And what was shocking was that, you know, back in the day, firms like Cravath were always lockstep. And, and many were. And slowly but surely, a lot of firms are changing out of that model and they're more focused on what the partner brings to the table so that now the law firms, it's not just a law firm client, it is a relationship with the partner. So I, I think one of the biggest shockers was that when Barche years ago uh, left and went to Cravath, he was making a very good living at Cravath, a phenomenal living. And then all of a sudden, you know, the whole voice comes along and yeah, allegedly, allegedly doubled, doubled the salary. I mean, just imagine going down the street and you get paid double. You already know you're making a lot of cravath and then you just go down the street to Paul Weiss and suddenly they're doubling your compensation. And so that sets up the whole market for somewhat of a, you know, for lack of a better word, a bidding war. And everybody wants to get top talent. So regardless of market conditions, when you have top talent and you have a revenue generator, they're always going to command top dollar. And that's th those are the type of candidates with whom Gary and I work. Next question. I'd love to kind of create some context. Gary, you used the word elite practice. Um, can you define a little bit more about what is elite now? Because elite practice maybe was three to five million ten years ago. Where it is <laughs> now, uh, and yeah, it, explain. Uh, 
Okay, and there's, there's and obviously bill rates, size of book, types of clients, things like that. So, just to give you an idea, I've over my career talked to a handful of folks with nine figure practices. Okay, um, some of them we've worked with, tried to move, couldn't move. A lot of times, they those create a whole different issue in terms of how embedded they are yeah. across a firm's plat, their current firm's platform, but so. An elite practice, in my mind, is what law firm leaders, if you talk to law firm leaders, they will tell you what is called a destination practice for a client vertical, sector vertical, okay? So whether you're talking about a practice in M&A, cross-border M&A, or a practice in uh, top-tier patent litigation, or a practice in restructuring, like we saw the, the group from Struck go to go to Paul Hastings, right? That that generated you talk we started this program off talking about press. Well, that was an elite restructuring practice with a very specific focus that Paul Hastings obviously felt was strategic, right? And so elite, you know, has several dynamics or or, you know, tentacles to it, but it's practice size, you know, with a with a year over year track record of performance. It's it's profit margin within the practice unit, you know, in terms of because all you know part of the elite practice uh, uh, designation is that all practices of equal size in terms of revenue are not created equal, right. right? It's how many people, how many lawyers are needed to service that practice. Is the team lean? You know, what are the utilization rates of the people on the team? It, it gets down to all the metrics that law firms use to determine whether or not they are, you know, uh, uh, moving the needle, you know, upward with respect to their own profitability. So it is a practice that's recognized in the industry vertical as one of the top practices. So they get the calls when companies have those types of issues. Uh, it's a practice that year over year generates, you know, Significant revenue. Is that 10 million? Is that 100 million? It can depend on the type of practice, right? Like, you know, there's elite, plenty of elite IP litigators. People, you know, most recruiters are happy to work with eight figure IP litigators. There's some that are doing 10 million. There's some that are doing, you know, close to 100 or more million, right? Like, so there's always degrees of eliteness, right? You know, is it a Hall of Fame practice versus an All Star practice? You know that if we want to use a sports analogy, Thank but, you, but that, <laughs> but that's what when I say elite, we're talking about all those dynamics in assessing the practice and the practitioner. Talk to me about bill rates. I mean, significant increase in bill rates. What are you seeing for these practices? What kind of bill rates? Dan, why don't you go to this? You're in New York, so. Yeah. <laughs> Our billing rates are very high here. Yeah, I was going to also dovetail off of what Gary said previously about the elite practice. I think you hit the nail on the head, Gary. I think you also have to have that practice year after year. If one partner comes and says, look, I had a banner year with a litigation and they settled and they got a huge settlement. And for one year only after years of not making any money in the litigation and they just happen to hit that year, you have to take that into consideration. Is it? It's not year after year. Sometimes it's just you have one good year. But elite practice to me seems to be annually you're producing with the same client and the same client relationships year after year that can prove uh, somewhat reliable moving forward that you will in the future probably get more work from that client. But billing rates, oh my goodness, billing rates, even in this crazy market, even in, in, with the anticipation of a downward market, uh, billing rates are high. If you're an elite firm, there's a word again, but if you're one of the top firms, you can bill um, a lot. The clients, I mean, sometimes um, if you're a bet the bank litigation law firm or you're, you're the bet the corporate bank, or you're, you're uh, betting the corporate, uh, what word am I looking for? If you, if you need that like corporate, top corporate firm, right, the elite firm, you're going to pay whatever the market commands. And some of them are upward of, I mean, the numbers are astounding, upward of three, four thousand an hour, sometimes yeah, more. I mean, so markets differ. I've heard Hong Kong and London get up there. There's a couple in the, you know, but I would say that. It's not uncommon now where it was 10 years ago. It's not uncommon now to see people with $1,500 an hour rates, $1,600 an hour rates, $2,000 an hour rates. The three and 4,000, like, you know, 
that might be one or two, right? Like you're talking about, then you're talking about the Mount Rushmore's of the practice area at most <laughs> for the biggest matters and the, you know. Right. It's right. not uncommon when you're talking about a big, a, a meaningful group with an elite practice for the associates to be billing a thousand dollars plus an hour. Yes. And that was unheard of years ago. And now it's, it's, it's pretty common. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned associate because uh, we have seen significant inflation on that first year salary. Um, so being that you guys operate at this level for placement, you're dealing with law firm management. And obviously it's all about the profitability because not every practice is created equal. So talk to me about these outrageous salaries on a first year salary alone. You know, is it sustainable? You know, how do the rates work with that? Um, what are you seeing even for profitability within firms, the competition, the trends? I mean, three years from now, is it going to be 250? Like, I'm just curious. I, I think it'll go as far as the market can command. I mean, again, I always go back to when I first started uh, in the legal recruiting field, and I remember it was such a big deal when the dot coms came about, and all of a sudden the law firms are paying a whopping one hundred twenty thousand. Like Scadden was the first mover at a one hundred twenty thousand. People are like, "Oh, this market's crazy. How could it go up higher?" And then it just kept climbing from there. And then you had the dot com clients that were willing to pay, you know, a premium rate for associates and. It just seems that it just keeps going up and up. I think as long as the clients um, keep paying, you can you can command as much as you want for the associates. I don't think there's a bar to uh, or or that will uh, you know lower the rates. I think they're going to just keep going up. I think and, and I, I think that firms right? will give discounts, but yeah, yeah they might no, get discounts. Sure. Sorry, Gary, but they might get. Yeah. Sorry, they might get discounts in in uh, in the in, uh, in maybe in a down market, but for the most part, they're probably going to still keep the compensation rates the same for associates. Yeah. You know, Sorry, Gary, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's interesting because that is that is becoming a more public reported tension that exists between the legal consumer and the legal providers, right? And there's, you know, there's going to be that tension, that tension increases. But the reality is for the most pressing matters that are, and I think Sharon, what she was looking for was bet the company, whether it's a big time. <laughs> My clock probably kicked in. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> whether it's, a, whether it's a, a, a litigation that will totally change the economic, you know, the the financial model of a, of a big company, or whether it's privately held or, or public, all of these things, you know, at the end of the day, when the boards and the decision makers in a corporate company structure say, "Okay, I've got to be able to go to my board." and say, even if we lose, we went with the best, right? If I didn't go with the best and we lose, I'm out of a job. And, and you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on the street looking. So, you know, I think that, that it will continue to drive the market with respect to associate salaries, which is a problem profitability-wise mm -hmm. for most firms because firms need to want to be able to compete, yeah. particularly in major high billing rate markets because that's what drives profitability but you know when you start and, and and this actually has an impact on something that we talked about or alluded to during conversation the merger game a lot of times you know mergers that were done four and five years ago probably you know where an amlaw 200 an amlaw 100 acquires a regional firm or or it's very hard to make those templates fit now as as the higher levels of the market go up, 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 up in terms of associate salaries, because it it transferring that new entity onto the template, you see huge expense overlays because you now have to pay a so as opposed to paying them, you know, whatever you're paying your first, second, third year associates in Nashville, for example. You know, at most big firms, still it's it's based on class year and there are distinguishing things, but, and some firms do it, you know, market to market, but it's harder, it, it, you know, they have problems internally with that as well. So they're, it, to make those pro formas work becomes harder and harder when you have such elevation of associate salaries. So I think that is always going to be something that keeps large law firm leaders up at nights is how do we deal with the tension from the clients 
given that we still have to to be able to pay associates what we have to pay them to be or what they have to pay them to be competitive, they have to continue raising rates. And so, you know, it I don't know how sustainable it is over the long haul. Um, I I I know there's a lot. I have friends who are you know, GCs or assistant GCs at Fortune 10 companies, Fortune 50 companies, what have you. And that tension's real and the pushback is yeah. real and it's it's going to continue to be that. So the, the long-term view, I don't know how sustainable it is, but a lot of firms are competing in waters that they, that they can't if they want to continue raising profitability. Yeah. You know, if you're in an AMLA 80 firm or an AMLA 60 firm, it's very hard to compete with, taking on that added expense with an MLA 10 firm yeah. in terms of profitability. Yeah. Gary, you brought up your friends and it, so with my practice, mostly in corporate in-house counsel placements, the law firm right. decisions to raise those rates or those um, salaries for their attorneys, it was incredibly disruptive for corporate legal departments across the United States. Um, yeah. And we saw outrageous inflation for their roles. Now, that's great for recruiters, but it's so hard on our candidates. <laughs> and corporate legal departments yeah. and chief legal officers and general counsels are freaking out. They're losing all their teams because they're either going to yeah. corporations that can write the check or they're going back to big law. All those attorneys are leaving. Yeah. And so it created a crisis. I mean, law firms had their own crisis because of the demand. And then you got corporate legal departments having this outrageous crisis because of the cost. Yeah. And HR is like, are you kidding me? We have to pay 20, 30, or even as much as 100% more than what we're used to paying. It's it's interesting. It's it's a problem. Yeah, and, and I think you'll continue to see, you know, that push and pull tension and discussion about alternative fee arrangements and, and pricing models. And you see law firms, law firms, the smart ones, have really started to invest in non-lawyer business professionals, yeah structures internally to figure out how to best price their product so that they can be the most competitive, you know, in any given industry vertical. So it is, it's something that, and as recruiters, you know, being aware of that, having the length of, of, you know, uh, uh, practice that Sh Sharon has and that I have, where we talking to law firm leaders about these types of issues for, for, the time that we have, it it does, I think, bring value to a process because I think we can really help the parties try to find, you know, a good middle ground in terms of the candidate and, and the law firm understanding and, you know, and being sensitive to really what's going on when the pro formas are being written, right? And, 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 and constructed to see if something can work, if something's expandable, what's the growth you know, uh, growth estimate and, and where's the value, then how much should that value show up in terms of a compensation package that's provided to the partners? So, you know, but it is, it's going to, it's not going to get easier. Well, so I would love to continue in this direction because we're sort of dealing with some predictions and things happening. And we all know this is a cyclical business, a cyclical market. Um, so I'd love to pick on your, both of your long tenured history in this industry um, so we are in the age of consolidation for law firms and, um, over the past, especially since 2008, there's been some failures. We've seen combinations and mergers and other things take place. I would love for you to share, um, some of your predictions in what you would anticipate say in the near term, midterm and long term. Sharon, why don't you go first? I think, yeah, I, I think in the long term, I, I think that there will be a continuation of some of the smaller firms that can't be as competitive to be acquired by the larger firms. Um, some of them will be challenging because some of their financials may not fit what the Global 100 has with their standard template of financial compensation. But that being said, I think these firms will have to make some type of decision because it's becoming so competitive from a technology standpoint and from a marketing standpoint, what these big law firms can do with their footprints all over the world. They're so international these days. Uh, and I think that that's what the clients want. And some of the law firms even that had been in the past begrudgingly saying, 
we don't have to expand for expansion's sake. We don't need to do that. I think they are taking another look at their business plans and figuring out a way to expand and to have that international reach to be competitive. So I think there will be a, a continuation of that. Um, and it's and it's tough because even going back to the example that I used of the merger that I did previously, the firm had been around since the 1850s. And, you know, it, it, the, each decade, the law firms are just getting bohemoth. I mean, we're not talking about just multi-billion dollar firms. We're talking about trillion dollar firms and, and large firms that are 4,000 lawyers. And, you know, before back in the day, maybe a 500 lawyer firm was a big firm. And now it's eight times that amount, 10 times that amount. So um, the upward trend, I think, will be that... Uh, Smaller firms will try to remain competitive, and if they can't, they're going to have to entertain options on other ways to do that. Yep, yep. Maintaining client bases is a big thing for for smaller regional firms, yep. right? Like, how do you maintain your, your clients when they need services that you may not be able to provide coming down the pike, right? Uh, I so I think Sharon touched on that, so I'll touch on like trends as I see with respect to practice. Okay. Areas, I think that's also the yeah. question. You know, so if, if you know, Stan brought up something. You know, in discussing, uh, we were talking earlier in the, in the uh, segment about uh, the SPAC explosion and how that impacted the, you know, tremendous performance of firms in 2020 and into 2021. If you look at the historical, you know, SPAC practice, there's been four or five cycles like this in the last 20 it happens every five or six years where spec SPACs explode on the capital markets uh scene in terms of the transactional practice and then afterwards there's always rash of litigation related to deals that were done under yeah. SPAC, right and so i expect that this will be well it has its own specific you know time context uh dynamics i i expect we're going to see a lot of deal related litigation globally um with respect to you know all the the because everybody and their mother wanted a SPAC you know it's, it was almost like in social circles you were no one if you didn't have a SPAC you know <laughs> and, and so um but I think you'll see that I think I I think that there are going to be Gary some, don't forget crypto yeah well I'm, don't forget so, crypto how I, so it, that's like so whenever there's the types of things that we see happen with respect to transactions around any given thing, when those start to go bad, there's always investigations, litigations, you know, all kinds of of regulatory issues. So I think you'll you'll see those practices very very healthy in the next you know couple of years, maybe maybe for like you know think about Enron, how much litigation. And for for a decade, basically, did did Enron right in it provide law firms? Um, I think you'll also see that there are certain uh, industry sectors that are going to be somewhat not I won't say immune, but somewhat resilient, and and that's obviously going to be life sciences and healthcare. Okay, those are two sectors. And that's and so that's why you see, for example, Holland and Knight goes to Nashville and takes on a 280 whatever lawyer firm because of what they bring in private equity and what they bring as sure. private equity connected yeah. to healthcare, right? So even though this is not the ideal time, you know, because see, there's some people say this is not the ideal time to be taking on a big chunk of transactional lawyers and, and you know, private equity lawyers, smart law firm leaders, like the ones at Holland Knight say, oh, our contraire. It's absolutely still like time because, you know, healthcare in in this country and globally is not going to slow down. You know, we have aging populations. We have so and life sciences. I think is also one of those and and probably digital. You know, digital currency and fintech would be the the other elements of that that you know Sharon raised with respect to to crypto. I think we'll see that those in, industries. Regardless of the economic environment, regardless of the interest rates, there will be work in those sectors for law yeah. firms. Yeah, I think that's definitely fair. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, and also I think sometimes law firms are smart. If there is a down market, in this case, we're going down into um, a potential recession where corporate work won't be as as strong. 
sometimes it's smart if a firm can pick up on the corporate side, corporate healthcare, corporate work, uh, when it's not thriving, when they don't have to pay top dollar to get that practice. So sometimes the timing might revolve around, um, we can get a good corporate practice now because they might not be as busy, they can move, and they might not command top dollar. So you never know. There's always a you know different way of, of thinking about why a deal might be done and the timing of it. I'll, I'll bring up something I just noticed in the Wall Street Journal this morning, which is uh, the FTC lifting non-competes. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, only <laughs> only will allow them for the sale of a business, but every other notion of a non-compete lifted in the United States, that sounds like an absolute mess. Um, it's going to be lots of Holy things. cow. That's going to have lots yes. of oh, That's going to be very, yes. you know beneficial to the law firms at that point. And then you've got, so, I mean, you've got the F- FTC and the SEC. So everything's very administration driven right now within DC practices. Um, I mean, look at Microsoft on their acquisition spree. A lot of these companies are sitting on cash that they haven't spent. And if they're going to acquire companies, this notion of um, uh, antitrust is going to be a mess with this administration. And so it'd be fascinating uh, to see what deals can actually get done and how much fighting and money being spent on that. Holy cow. So, you know, it, speaking of antitrust, I once worked with someone and knew someone who was involved at the time what had been the biggest antitrust case. This was years ago. I won't name the case. I won't say. But just to give you an idea of the legal spend, Okay, uh, I, there was one thing that this person told me that stood out over, and I will tell you, it was an eight. It was an eight-figure number that that a pretty good eight-figure number annually for five six years on this case. The documents in the case alone, if you stack them one on top of the other, would circle the globe four times. Okay, <laughs> it's been a lot of lawyer hours. So yes, these antitrust law firms are looking at. How can we beef up our anti? Because there are going to be antitrust issues galore, I think, in in you know across sectors, across industries. Right? Yeah. yeah. It, let's talk about, and we don't have to list firms. Um, we there's a little bit just to kind of mention um, history, but um, you know, I forgot. I think if it was Buffett or someone had said, you know. Watch and see who's swimming naked when the water recedes. So we're going to see a, a, rec- a receding of water. And there are firms that are not as healthy as others. Um, and I anticipate some failures or some rescues that are going to be anticipate coming. Do you two see that? Yes, I, I think that you are absolutely correct. I, I think there will be a, a spotlight on the firms that are not doing as well. So if a firm wasn't doing well during the best of times, certainly during a downturn, um, they're going to have issues with compensation possibly. They're going to have issues with um, you know, their clients not paying. You know, they're gonna, And if they're not well-funded, these law firms, and the clients aren't paying, that's going to present issues all with, with it's, within itself. So I think that... Um, this happens in every cycle. Firms get exposed, and um, that's usually when some of the big mergers talks start taking place. Yeah, I I think that, you know, I don't know that it's going to be like it was. You know, if you look at, like, I think, like, a really heavy period of that was we saw a few, at least domestically, right? We saw several rescues in 2000, you know, and firms go under in 2009, 10, 11, and 12, right? Like, that four-year period would probably... And, and, you know, interesting enough, a lot of people know, like, every, every time a firm fails, it doesn't mean that they're not profitable and they're not still making money, but it just means that somehow, some way, they're leveraged into a situation that leads to, a lot of times, partner concern, partner your discontent, yeah. you know, take the one firm that, you know, take Dewey out of it, right, where, you know, there was questions about the dual sets of books yeah. and all that, but you... You know, you're saying that, and I think Sharon is, you know, kind of alluded to this, but what you'll see is every time a firm, particularly in a down market where the time, where, the, where, it's, where it's getting harder, uh, if we're not ahead of the game in 2020, 2021, 
then you're probably not well situated and if you struggle now forward uh once you start to see numbers of partners leaving then that becomes a downward cycle and 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 firms start to worry if covenants are going to get breached and and a lot of times that's when you see you know firm rescues needing to happen um i and i think there's more firms on that line than people you know and i think it's a tricky line where they they're avoiding it you know but I would not be surprised in the next two, three years to see something like that happen, right? Where a major, you know, AMLA 200 or 100 firm is, is struggling enough where, and, I, and now these, because I know these conversations are happening, you know, all the time right now. I mean, some firms are trying to get out there, yeah. right? Like there, there are more AMLA 100 yeah. to 100 conversations now, most of them don't end up going anywhere, um, you know, or going all the way. But there are more AMLA 100 to 100 conversations than there ever were, you know, five, six, 10, 12 years ago. Um, so consolidation is constantly on, on you know, the minds of folks. And a lot of times that has to do with, a, at the most fundamental level, it does come down to financial performance at some, at some with respect to some level. Yeah. So, so appreciate both of your time. Um, what is the best way if a client or a candidate wants to reach out to you? Um, how, how should they approach you? It's the best way to find you. I'm constantly updated on LinkedIn. So feel free to go to my LinkedIn profile where I'm very active. Um, I can, I'm, I'm as well active on LinkedIn, but also uh, my website at, at milespartnerplacement.com. Um, you know, both of us, you, you know, over the years, you can also look us up in Law Dragon, you know, to get a, a sense of, of <laughs> you know, of, of how we do what we do and how we're recognized for it. So, uh, always interested in hearing from whether it's a law firm leader that has a growth plan and, and wants to do something significant or, you know, practitioners, obviously, you know, even if they're not sure they want to, but just want to kind of talk through what's going on in the market, uh, you know, always happy to be a resource to people, even if we never actually move them. So that's a great way to get in touch with us. Awesome. So Gary and Sharon, thank you so much. It's been an honor and pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me and great to see you again, Sharon. Never get to see you and talk to you enough and really enjoyed it today. Thank you so much, Chris. I love that I get to talk to two top industry leaders, Chris and Gary, and as well as my friends. So thank you so much. Today was a wonderful day. Thank you.